Hello. This session concerns itself with popular ragtime from 1906 to 1912. These are the rags that gained national fame, and we'll start with perhaps the first composer to do so, Charles L. Johnson. Charles Leslie Johnson was born in Kansas City, Kansas, in 1878, and he died there in 1950. He was the most successful of all of the popular ragtime composers, having composed more than 40 rags during his career. He was also a publisher. And during the time of 1897, 98, and 99, there were actually very few rags written, but there were tons of cakewalks, as we had noted earlier. In 1899, Scott Joplin, of course, published his first two rags, original rags and the maple leaf rag. The maple leaf being then the prototype of all rags from that time onward. In 1899, we find many ragtime composers doing cakewalks and publishing them under the title Rag. Charles L. Johnson was the exception. His 1899 tune is a real rag, and it's called Scandalous Thompson, now played for us by Naki Parker. Raggy sounds of Scandalous Thompson, Charles L. Johnson's first published rag of 1899. Usually we find when ragtime writers who become professional ragtime writers, that is, ones who turn out stuff time after time, we find that they do so in profusion. Once they get started, they never stop, and they just keep on writing rags, and they find publishers. In Charles L. Johnson's case, he started out as a uh, member of the Carl Hoffman music firm in Kansas City. This was a music store, and they were also publishers. And when Charles N. Daniels left Carl Hoffman to join the Jerome Remick Company of Detroit, then the largest sheet music publishing company in the United States. 
Charles L. Johnson took over his job with Carl Hoffman as general music editor for the firm. And so it's no surprise then that whenever Charles L. Johnson wanted to publish a piece, the Carl Hoffman firm published it. But what is surprising is that after doing a couple of cakewalks and this rag of 1899, Scandalous Thompson, nothing more was heard from Charles L. Johnson until 1902, when he did a, uh, another very unusual rag, another folk rag of the time, but sounding a lot different. This 1902 rag is a very scarce one. It's called Black Smoke, and we hear Terry Waldo perform it. Smoke, the 1902 composition of Charles L. Johnson. If we thought that three years was a long time for Johnson to write another rag, well, how about four years for his next one? In 1906, Charles Johnson comes in with the very first of the real hit pop rags called Dill Pickles Rag, 
1906. This was also the first rag to start the vegetable rag in the title Trends. And so let's listen now to Ralph Sutton perform Dill Pickles Rag, the first of the million-selling pop rags. version of Dill Pickles Rag by Ralph Sutton, the Charles L. Johnson composition of 1906. Speaking of performance, did you happen to notice what he did with that piece? Instead of being a four-section rag, it's a three-section rag. And every time he repeated, Sutton that is, repeated one of the sections, he would change it and alter it. And then finally turning it into a boogie-woogie. But Hopefully you got the sense of Dill Pickles. It was a very happy and joyous rag. No longer do we have the seriousness and the folk flavor, but this is just good time music. And as I said, this was the first million-selling pop rag of all time, and it also introduced the vegetable rag titles, because after Dill Pickles received such an overwhelming response from the general public, out came pickled beets, and then pickles and peppers, and there were all sorts of vegetable rags. Charles L. Johnson pioneering the way. He was such a prolific composer that he had to issue his tunes with under several different pseudonyms, and one of the pseudonyms he used was the name Raymond Birch. Under this name, he came out in 1908 with another successful rag, this time Powder Rag, played for us so that performance doesn't get in your way of listening to the various sections on a machine cut piano roll. The machine cut rolls, I hope you'll remember, are those rolls that were punched out by hand directly from the arrangement onto the paper. Nobody is playing the thing. This is the way it was written 
and this is the way it sounded to those people who would pump it in their living rooms in 1908. Powder rag, a machine cut piano roll. <laughs> Charles L. Johnson's Powder Rag, written under the name of Raymond Birch, 1908, a machine-cut piano roll version of it. And here we can perhaps, underlying the gaiety and the briskness, we can hear some of the folk melodies coming through. It's a very fine rag of the 1908 period. Just a little later on, we're going to hear the big hit from 1908. Then you can compare the difference in sound. But moving on very speedily to 1909, which was a banner year for Charles L. Johnson, his first big million-selling hit since Dill Pickles came out in 1909, and because Johnson was the first with his vegetable rags, he was also in 1909 the first with the animal rags. So why don't we now listen to his porcupine rag as performed by Prince's band, a contemporary recording.
And that was the very famous porcupine rag, the 1909 Charles L. Johnson winner, played for us by Charles Adams Prince and his military brass band. This was a contemporary 1909 recording. It was the hit that sold Porcupine Rag on records. And for a comparison of styles, and the type of band, and what they do with rags, I'd like us now to hear another 1909 composition of Charles L. Johnson's. This one is called Applejack, and it's played for us in 1965 by Red Nichols and his Five Pennies. <laughs> between the band interpretations. Prince's band was a military brass band, and they were very precise, very rhythmic, but very straight. And here, Red Nichols and his Dixieland band were taking great liberties and featured, of course, the piano. They were very smart. They didn't really orchestrate the rag, but let the piano take over and introduce it and then come in on the repeats and sort of jam a bit with the final write out as we heard very happy and charles l johnson's rags lend themselves to the very happy and toe tappy music and that's why i guess he was so very popular throughout his career which while starting in 1899 really got going in 1906 and from that point on for the next 10 years never let up keep having hit after hit his 1911 composition was called Comeback Rag, C-U-M-B-A-C, Comeback Rag. And now we'll hear Charlie Rash perform it.
and that was Charlie Rash performing Charles L. Johnson's very original and delightful comeback rag of 1911. To wind up the Charles Johnson segment of this session, I think it's only fitting that uh, we do his 1916 rag, published under the name of Raymond Birch. It's called Blue Goose Rag, and there's nothing more fitting than that I should do it because I record for Blue Goose Records. So here's my version of Charles L. Johnson's 1916 very famous rag, Blue Goose. Johnson's Blue Goose Rag, the last of his great hits of 1916, played by me. The next successful popular ragtime composer from this era of 1906 to 1912 is George Botsford. George Botsford was born in 1878 in South Dakota, where he, then he moved to Iowa and finally came to the big city, New York, where he eventually died in 1949. In 1908, his big hit was one of the most successful rags of all time, equal, in fact, to Charlie Johnson's Del Pickles of 1906, George Botsford's 1908 rag, Black and White Rag, performed for us in a contemporary recording, and it had to be an extremely successful recording because you see so many around today, by El Cota, a xylophone player.
Dakota was one of the last of the great virtuosi xylophone players that proliferated so much at the turn of the century. They and xylophone players and banjo players loved ragtime, and they recorded a great deal of it. Black and White Rag was another million-selling hit. It was a favorite, which remained a favorite for ragtimers and non-ragtimers alike throughout the years. George Botsford was very important because he didn't start out, even though coming from the Midwest, the Southwest, didn't start out doing folk things. He started right away with his Tin Pan Alley gaiety and brightness and very simple stuff. If you notice, Dill Pickles was a very dum, uh, da 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 type rhythm, and here, black and white rag is a dum ta tam ta tam tam ta tam ta tam rhythm. It's very simple. It's very effective. And that's the reason for its success. Not only the simplicity, but the happiness, the gaiety, the lightness of it. In 1910, Botsford struck it rich once again with another million-selling rag. This time, he enlisted the aid of Irving Berlin, who at that point was just beginning to make a name for himself, and Berlin put words to this dance that Botsford wrote. But we're going to hear the original instrumental version, and if Charlie Johnson could write in 1909 Porcupine Rag, we now have another animal rag from George Botsford. This one's called the Grizzly Bear Rag, played for us by Wally Rose. <laughs> The Grizzly Bear Rag, played for us by Wally Rose in a live performance. George Botsford's very famous million-selling hit, The Grizzly Bear Rag. Sophie Tucker made it famous in 1910. On to the next popular ragtime composer, good old Percy Wainrich. Percy the Kid. The ragtime kid, that is. Born in 1880 in Joplin, Missouri one of the few commercial Tin Pan Alley successes to come from Missouri. We knew, of course, that the St. Louis and uh, what is known as the classic ragtime composers, Scott Joplin and James Scott, Arthur Marshall, Scott Hayden, all came from Missouri, but they didn't write popular successes as these were. And here, the Missouri-born Percy Wainrich 
all of a sudden comes into our view. He started writing cakewalks and rags at the turn of the century, and it wasn't until 1906 that he came out with this particular mixture, this concoction. And concoction it is. It's called Dixie Blossoms. However, it's not all his. There are three sections to this rag, as in most of the popular Tin Pan Alley rags, except the first section, if you remember at a Georgia camp meeting the famous cakewalk by Carrie Mills, the first section should sound very familiar to you. If you also happen to know the J. Bodewalt Lamp cakewalk of 1900 Creole Bells, then the second section of Percy Wainrich's Dixie Blossoms should be very familiar to you. The third section, however, seems to be an original uh, melodic idea of Percy Wainrich's because I haven't been able to trace it down from where he stole it. Anyway, this is his Dixie Blossoms of 1906. The Dawn of the Century Ragtime Band will perform it. Dixie Blossoms is played for us by the Dawn of the Century Ragtime Band, a contemporary, this time I mean contemporary 1970s, West Coast band. Taking us back to 1907 with a contemporary, and then by that I mean a 1907 recording of Vessel Osman, the great banjoist, five-string banjoist of the day, helped make Percy's 1907 tune, The Smiler, popular. This, an example of Percy's borrowing themes or sections, to be putting it nicely, as we just heard Dixie Blossom's two of the three sections were actual steals from very well-known cakewalks, but he did it delightfully. Here in The Smiler, which was a big hit of his in 1907, the third section of this rag is almost identical to the third section in Scott Joplin's Peacherine Rag. Let's now listen to Vess Osman on his five-string banjo performing The Smiler Rag by Percy Wainrich. <laughs> 
Percy Wainrich's big hit of 1907. Also in 1907, Percy came out with another rag. In fact, he was a very prolific writer, as was Charles L. Johnson. They not only turned out rags, but they turned out pop songs. A couple of Percy's big hits was Put On Your Old Gray Bonnet, and When You Wore a Tulip, and he wrote marches and waltzes, and he wrote tons and tons of rags. But We've been hearing his hits, which were steals and similar sounding sections from other people's rags. And so it's nice in 1907 that he did write an original composition that was popular. It's called Sweet Meats Rag, and once again, the Dawn of the Century Ragtime Band performs Sweet Meats. <laughs> Thank you. 
that was Sweet Meats, an original this time for a change, Percy Wayne Rich hit of 1907, featuring the Dawn of the Century ragtime band. So the next two numbers of Percy's, his big hit of 1908, 1908 was a very successful year. Charlie Johnson, we heard Powder Rag, you'll recall. George Botsford, we heard Black and White Rag. And in 1908, Percy had a hit, a million-selling hit. This one is called Persian Lamb. I mean, my heavens, if Charlie Johnson can write Porcupine and Botsford can write Grizzly Bear, Percy can certainly come in with an animal. Here is Persian Lamb Rag, played for us on banjo by Bob Roberts. things up for this session. To compare banjo sounds, that was a 1950s recording of Persian Lamb Rag by Percy Wayne Rich in 1908. His last ragtime hit was in 1913, and Fred Van Epps, a superb five-string banjoist, recorded contemporaneously Percy's Whipped Cream Rag. Thank you. 
listening to Curriculum of the Air, a series of courses presented by the C.W. Post Center of Long Island University for college credit or for your personal enrichment. Today's lecture on the history of jazz was taught by Dave Jason, professor at the C.W. Post Center. <laughs>